excited today also. Um, just an exciting day, as I noted earlier, a uh, young man who's just like family to me, like my nephew, uh, Amani Henry, is here with us. Um, Amani is a blessing to the kingdom of God. He currently serves and has been serving for, since he was probably like seven, uh, as the uh, minister of music at St. Stephen AME Church in Detroit, Michigan. He's also, uh, I believe he's still at Hartford, Hartford uh, Memorial uh, Baptist Church, great historic church in Detroit, Michigan. I was blessed uh, years ago when I was looking for a musician for our eight o'clock service. My brother Michael was pastoring St. Stephen and Amani uh, spoke with his pastor, my brother Michael, and he was able to come over and work with us. So we used to have a dynamic time. So today he's going to just come and bless us uh, in whatever way God sees fit with the selection. Come on down, nephew. Let's give God some praise for Brother Monty Henry. He's going to bless us in whatever way God sees fit. I do bring you greetings from St. Stephen AME Church in Detroit, where the pastor is, Reverend Dr. Darrell Williams, also from the Michigan Conference and the 4th District, where our bishop is, John Franklin White, where I also have the opportunity to serve as a 4th District Music and Christian Arts Director. And I thank God for my Uncle Joe, who gave me so much support in being able to do that position. Um, as he said, uh, we are definitely like family. I enjoyed so much playing for him and worshiping with him. Um, I, I don't have to tell you, he is one that just allows freedom of expression in worship. And it's just such a breath of fresh air. It really is. Um, and I can tell this wonderful music ministry, God bless you. You really just bless my soul. That's one of my favorite songs. Um, so I'm not going to be before you long. I know every preacher says that uh, Uncle Joe has given me the opportunity to play and preach for him. So. Uh, I won't keep that lie before you, but I'm going to do my best to get in and get out of the way, okay? Uncle Joe, I understand that um, this can be a stressful time as you uh, aspire for the office of bishop. And so uh, God gave me this song specifically just to encourage you. It's called Stay Focused. That doesn't take away that life can bring us stress. So what do we do when faced with challenges of today? Stay focused forward. Focus on what the Lord can do. Stay focused on the Lord. We've never done it this way is what people tend to say when scared to open new doors but God designed us to create and innovate so stay focused Lord has done, you will see. 
see your life is full of many battles you have won. This time is no different because God always makes a way. Anybody believe that this morning? Come on, say focus, focus forward. Come on, let's give God some praise for Brother Armani. About to make me tear up. He actually wrote, I did not know this, that song for my campaign to run for bishop. Um, I didn't know. I didn't know. And it is now the campaign theme song. Brother Lavender, that's uh, our new campaign theme song. Um, God just places people in your life, everyone, that truly will be a blessing to you and a benefit to you as you are a blessing and a benefit to them. And I thank this young man. I thank his mother. Again, they are family. And um, God has great things in store. Uh, trust me, Alan Temple, if he didn't live so far away, if he didn't live in Detroit, uh, you'd be seeing a whole, 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 whole lot more of this young man, but um, truly he is a blessing. And I thank you so much again, Amani. Thank you, nephew, for all that you do. Well, everything ties in today. Uh, for those who would, if you would turn with us to our scripture, the 14th chapter of Romans, verses 1 through 13. 14th chapter of Romans, verses 1 through 13. Romans 14, 1 through 13. And it should be on the screen, but if you have your um, Bibles with you, please make sure and turn to your, uh, in your personal Bible, but we will have it on the screen. Romans 14, 1 through 13, and we find these words. I'm reading from the New Living Translation of the Bible. It's one that I prefer and I like, but again, yours may read differently. That's okay. It's all still the Word of God. Here the words of Paul is written to the church at Rome, Romans 14 chapter. Accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will only eat vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. Those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall, and with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. In the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor him. Those who eat any kind of food also do so to honor the Lord since they give thanks to God before eating 
And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. If we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be Lord of both living and dead. So why then do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. And yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning one another. Instead, decide to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to fall or to stumble. For a few moments today, as we celebrate the goodness of God, I ask that we would consider this subject. Don't lose your focus. Don't lose your focus. How many times have we overly concerned ourselves with stuff that doesn't matter? How many times have we gotten bogged down dealing with things that are really absolutely of no consequence to us at all? Have you ever spent so much time focusing on something that was so trivial, that was so menial, that was so petty, when you finally stopped focusing on that thing, you realized and felt ashamed at how much time you had wasted. I can't speak for anybody else, but I know that I've wasted too much time focusing on stuff that just doesn't matter. Perhaps this is the reason, and it's funny how things tie together. I did not know Amani was going to sing this song. I did not know he wrote this song uh, as preparation uh, for this sermon. God had it all worked out. That's why God led me around this theme as my aspiration to become a bishop in our church. And the theme is that one simple word. The word is focused. Because I think we spend too much time focusing on stuff that doesn't matter. I'm excited to hear what our candidates for school board have to say. Why? Because I think sometimes, especially in our schools, we do diversionary tactics to try to focus on stuff that doesn't matter when we forget about the things that really do matter. It's imperative that in whatever we do, in whatever field we're in, in whatever uh, thing that we desire to accomplish or achieve, we don't lose our focus. Matter of fact, many people call this majoring on the minors, when we spend major time dealing with minor stuff. This is not what God desires from us. This is what not, what, not what God has for us because God wants us to be about God's business. But nevertheless, we still find ourselves spending too much time focusing on stuff that doesn't matter. So I believe that Paul gives us some insight as to how we can maintain and why we should maintain our focus in this chapter found in the book of Romans. In this passage of scripture found in that 14th chapter of Romans, we find Paul writing to the church at Rome about not losing our focus. Paul begins by telling them to accept other believers who are weak in their faith. Don't argue with them about what is right or what is wrong. Instead, the arguments about what is right and what is wrong, what to eat and what not to eat, what day to worship and, one not, and what day not to worship and all the things of that nature really, really belong to God. And Paul says, it is our desire and understanding to lift one another up, not tear one another down. It is our desire, it is our will to follow and be committed to God and to understand that in following God, our job is to keep our sisters and brothers from stumbling, not to be a stumbling block for them. How many of us have found ourselves losing our focus? In different places, in different aspects of our lives, I'm sure that all of us from time to time have done this. And that's why it's so important that we maintain the focus in our lives on the things that really matter. Because what matters in life to me and what matters in life I hope to you is simply this. No matter what I do, I will adhere to the will of God. I will allow the will of God to direct my life. I will follow God wherever God leads and my focus will always be squarely on God and what God wants me to do. So. For a few minutes today, for those that may have lost their focus, it's no shame in admitting that you've lost your focus. 
sometimes, even today, I still lose my focus. But God is helping me to redirect it every day through these principles. And I pray these same principles are going to help you redirect your focus as well if you have lost it. So what happens when we lose our focus? Well, first thing that happens is when we lose our focus, we forget who is really in charge. When you lose focus, you forget who's really in charge. Um, first thing that happens when we lose our focus and, and, and things become blurry or we become distracted or we just can't really get it together, I think what happens is the first thing that, that occurs to us is we lose sight of who's really in charge, who's really in command, and who's really in control. In fact, this is what messes many of us up in our lives. I know it messes me up because I get confused sometimes when I lose my focus. I get confused because I forget who's really in charge. And sometimes when I forget who's in charge, no, let me be honest, every time when I forget who's in charge, then I tend to believe I'm the one in charge. And because I think I'm the one in charge, I focus on the wrong things and lose sight of the right things simply because I forgot who was in charge in the first place. So we've got to understand that we are not, we never have been, nor will we ever be in charge. It is God that is at the helm, that is at the front, that is at the lead, and that is at the head of everything that we do. God is always in charge. So in the text, Paul writes, except believers who are weak in faith, don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. How many religious and societal arguments have we participated in about who is right and who is wrong? Judging someone else based on what we think is right versus what they think is right, what we think is wrong versus what they think is wrong. When at the end of the day, none of us really determine that. It is God that is the determining factor. So Paul goes on to write a little bit about the arguments that they have, and, and there are arguments that, that you would expect people to have, new believers to have, those new in the faith would have. Uh, he goes on to write arguments about food. They said certain foods you can eat and certain foods you, you can't eat. Um, some people believe in eating certain things and other people believe in eating different things. This was hearkening back to uh, the time of those that, that were coming over uh, and converting over from Judaism and they were not able to eat certain foods and they were carrying things over into this new belief, into this new faith. So they were having these food-centered arguments. Paul warns them and says, look, don't condemn people about what they eat because regardless of the food they're eating, God has already accepted them. Then Paul writes that the Lord judges them regarding the food, and with God's help, they'll do what's right and receive the approval of God. In other words, Paul is just telling the people, stop worrying about all of this small stuff and just realize God is really in charge. My sisters and brothers, arguments about food and arguments about so many other religious and, and even social and societal interpretations have been occurring since the beginning of time and will continue to occur uh, uh, to the end of time. Political parties and ideologies and differences will always be there. One group will think this, one group will think that, another group will think that, then you'll get another group that thinks something that nobody else thinks because everybody's thinking something different. But within these arguments, people try to determine what is right based upon what they think and what is wrong based upon what they think and will tell you what's right based upon what they think and will tell you what's wrong based upon what they think. But Paul says, stop trying to tell people what food to eat, what thing to do, or how to run or how to determine their life. Let God be the one to do that for them. Because what happens, my sisters and brothers, is lost in all of these things, when I lose my focus, I find myself oftentimes listening to what somebody else is telling me to do. 
And when I find myself listening to what somebody else is telling me to do, I forget to focus on the only one that can really tell me what to do, that's God, and to stop worrying about what other people say you have to do. And what Paul is reminding the people is he says, look, no matter what anybody else tells you, if you know you've got a right relationship with God, if you know you're doing what's acceptable and pleasing in the sight of God, if you know that you are focused and zero and lasered in on what God would have you to do, you don't have to worry about what anybody else says. Don't lose your focus. God is in charge. Stop focusing on the wrong things. Stop being distracted by other people's opinions. It took me a long time to get to that point where we stop focusing on other people's opinions. And, and, and to those candidates, especially, that are running for school board, you're going to have all kind of people tell you you can't win. I have people telling me every day when I travel to place to place running for bishop, oh, you're too young, you can't win. Oh, you got the wrong last name, you can't win. Oh, you're go, not going to do this, you can't win. And at the end of the day, all I do is smile and say, thank God you're not in charge, and thank God God is in charge. Because last time I checked, God has the final say over everything that happens in our lives, so my focus is not going to be, excuse me if I'm offending somebody, my focus ain't on you today my focus is on God because God's the one that's in charge we lose our focus when we forget God is in charge second thing Paul teaches us we lose our focus when we lose our focus we miss the point of worship when we lose our focus not only do we forget God is in charge we begin to think that we or somebody else is in charge if we're not careful when we lose focus, we'll also miss the whole point of worshiping in the first place. Our worship is our devotion and, and, and love of God and for God. Our feeling of profound love and, and admiration for God. Our acknowledgement that God is the head of our lives. Really, our worship just, just ties into what the first point was. Our worship is just the acknowledgement that God is in charge. That's what worship is. When you worship and when you go before the Lord and when you ask to be entered and ushered into the, 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 the space that God inhabits and the space where God is, where it's just you and God, regardless of even if you're in a room full of people, when it's just you and God there, what you're doing in your worship, the first thing that we do, we're just acknowledging the fact that I control nothing, God controls everything. And you're acknowledging the fact that it is God that is truly in charge. But when we focus on the wrong people and the wrong things and the wrong ideals and just the petty stuff that, sent, that tends to distract us, we can lose the point of worshiping in the first place. Matter of fact, how many people have gotten caught up in the wrong aspects of worship that they forget about why they worship in the first place? Coming to church, uh, especially um, um, those that, it's a little different now, post-pandemic, but especially pre-pandemic, coming to church, focusing on the wrong things. You ever seen people come into church so concerned with what somebody else is wearing? So concerned with what songs are being sung? So concerned with, 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 with what the style of worship is or so concerned with what they think ought to be done? So concerned about what the attire is? So concerned about stuff that really doesn't matter because the whole point of worship is not looking at other people in worship. The point of worship is thanking God for the opportunity you have to worship yourself. So it's my thanking God for the opportunity God has given me just to come into the physical space or now the virtual space, wherever God inhabits, and say, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to understand you are the head of my life. Paul, again, writes about another instance of losing focus, and it regards worship. He says, people are arguing about the appropriate day to worship. I've had people argue with me about this all the time. You know, if you go back to the Old Testament and the way the Old Testament says it, Saturday ought to be the day that we worship because, you know, Saturday is the day. And that's real, the real Sabbath. And all y'all who are worshiping on Sunday are worshiping on the wrong Sabbath. And, you know, that's what God really wants us to do. God wants us to worship on Saturday, not Sunday. So that ought to be your Sabbath. And you ought to be ashamed of yourself, uh, you know, for doing that. And I said, okay, I understand that. And I appreciate your argument. When was the last time you've been to Saturday Sabbath worship? Well, I hadn't been in a long time myself, but, you know, I'm just letting you know you're worshiping on the wrong day. No. 
This is my understanding. Whatever day you give God, give God that day. Matter of fact, we ought to give God more than one day, but whatever day you give God, give God that day. Let, let that be the day you give God. Let that be your reasonable and acceptable sacrifice and service to God. And regardless of what anybody else says, keep it moving. Paul says, they're focusing on the wrong stuff. And, and, and I'm not going to get into this today. Maybe I'll get into it another day at another time. But, you know, all these things are nothing but tricks and, 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 and distractions of the enemy trying to get us to focus on fighting each other as opposed to focus on fighting those powers and principalities, those spiritual wickedness in high places that we can't even really see. But nevertheless, they're fighting about the day to worship. And he says, the day, Paul says, is not as important as the act because no matter what day it is, we should all give the Lord at least one day of honor. Our job is to honor God, not to fight over the right day to honor God. Fighting over the right day to honor God is pointless, especially when in fighting over the right day to honor God, we're not even giving God the honor on that day anyway. How many times have people argued about what they feel regarding worship? The right day to worship, the right place to worship, how to worship, what worship involves. Matter of fact, this was the whole discussion that Jesus had with the woman at the well, if you remember, about worship. Where do we worship? Should we worship on this mountain or that mountain, this place or that place? And Jesus tells her, worship is really about worshiping God who is spirit and who is in truth, so we must worship God and we must be in spirit and in truth. And all of the arguments regarding worship, the right day, the wrong day, the right way, the right place, are all instances on focusing on the wrong aspects of worship. So this is what I've come to understand. When I lose my focus and begin to argue about stuff that really doesn't matter, like what day to worship, the easiest thing for me to do is just worship God every day. The easiest thing to do if you're worried about what day to worship God is to worship God every day. And worshiping God as great as Jimmy is and as great as Anthony is, as great as Maria is, as great as Shaquita is, as great as Amani is, uh, as, as great as your pastor, your preacher, whoever might be, we are not required for you to have worship. All that's required for you to have worship is for you to make the admission that God, I'm asking you to fill up this empty pitcher. I'm asking you, Lord, to do the most that you can with this empty vessel. I'm asking you, Lord, to take away the me that's messing me up and fill me with the you that's really in charge and help me understand I don't control any of this. I'm going to stop focusing on that which I don't control. And instead, I'm going to begin to worship God. And when you find yourself worshiping God, you won't need a choir to back you up. When you find yourself worshiping God, you won't need music playing to make you feel happy. Matter of fact, when you find yourself worshiping God, all you need is you and whatever space you're in and saying, Lord, I come to you right now, opening myself up to you, emptying myself up to you, and you'll find that somehow God will make everything all right. Don't lose focus forgetting who's in charge and don't lose focus by missing the point of worship. And here's the one that really, really gets me. When we lose our focus, more than likely, we're going to cause someone else to fall. When we lose our focus, we forget God is in charge. When we lose our focus, we miss the point of worship. And when we lose our focus, we will cause someone else to falter. And we will cause someone else to fall. Why I hold the position that God has blessed me to have in such high esteem is not so much because I'm a pastor, not so much because I have a microphone in my hand, not so much because I have a collar that I can wear and a uniform that when people see me, they'll say, oh, there goes a pastor, there goes a preacher. No, the reason I hold this in such high esteem is people listen to the words I say, and when I, they listen to the words I say, the words I say can cause them if I'm not careful, to stumble. <laughs> what bothers me today in the world we live in, especially regarding the events, and some of you are not going to like this, but it, it is what it is, regarding January 6th, a lie is a lie, and the truth is the truth. If people are looking for you to give them truth, 
but you're giving them lies, all you're doing is causing somebody to stumble and the fault of their stumble is not on them. The fault of the stumble comes on you simply because you're telling them something that's not true. And Paul says this. He says, be careful about what you say, these arguments that you have, the, the, the power you think you have, the things you think you're able to do, because what you're doing is you're ultimately causing someone else to falter. So in the text, last time, Paul began the scripture by writing about accepting other believers who are weak in faith, not arguing with them about what they believe. And immediately, Paul says to the believers that are weak in faith, look at those who are strong in faith as an example. Paul then writes, when we argue about such things as food in the day of worship, we're living in a way that will cause weak believers to stumble and fall. Paul is saying the more people see you do this stuff, the more they will stumble and the more they will fall. If people are coming to church looking for church to be a refuge, but they see the people in the church acting no different than the people in the world, what are they supposed to expect? If people come to a place looking for refuge and looking for shelter, but instead the first thing we do when they walk into church is tell them what they have on is not appropriate. Tell them what they're wearing is not up to standard. Tell them what they have on is, is, is not up to par. Tell them, no, you can't wear that in here. No, you can't have that on in here. All that's doing is taking somebody, watch this, who was coming into a safe space and letting them know the space that was supposed to be safe is not as safe as I thought it was. If when somebody walks in the church, the first thing you do is talk about all the bad stuff they used to do or talk about the fact that how long it's been since you You've seen them or talk about what you think they're not doing the place where they come that should be a safe space has now become a space of, 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 of difficulty for them because what they're supposed to find in church they're not finding in church because the people in church are focused on the wrong things I'm not focused on those who are not returning to physical church I'm not focused on that. I'm focused on the fact that right now there are at least as many people watching us online, probably more people watching us online than are even gathered in this physical space. So I don't see that as something to lament. I see that as something to celebrate because regardless of whatever they're doing, they're worshiping. They might not be with us physically, but they're still worshiping. And God is letting us all know, continue to lift one another up. Don't cause each other to stumble. So here's where we are. Come on, stand all across sanctuary. This is the question I have for you today. Are you focused on the right things? Are you one who walks around thinking you're in charge? Thinking you're really doing something? Thinking that you're the man or you're the woman or you're really the one doing this without understanding that here's the thing, none of us wouldn't have, would have, we wouldn't have anything were it not for God. So God's the one that's really in charge. Stop missing the point of worship because you lose your focus. I'm, I'm not gonna hold you, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and close it, but. There, there is a, a story I would tell. I'm not going to tell the story today, but long story short, don't spend so much time looking at what everybody else is doing that you miss what you're doing. I think the Bible says something about that, doesn't it? Dr. Tammy, doesn't the Bible say something about the log in, in your eye and the speck of dust in your neighbor's? I think it's in there. I believe it's in there. If I'm worried so much about that little, that little spot on you, but I got a whole stain on me, worship. And you don't have to worship on Sunday. Those that are wa watching virtually, you don't have to worship here in the building. Would I like to see you back in the building? Of course I would. would I love, of course I would, because that's what we're used to. That's what we want to see. We want to see fellowship. But is your worship any less impactful because you're somewhere else? No, it is not. Is your worship any less impactful even when it's not on Sunday? No, it's not. Is your worship any less impactful because there's no musicians, no wonderful, awesome praise team, musicians, and choir? No, it's not. Because the point of worship is to acknowledge the worth and the lordship of God over our lives. And finally, whatever you do, remember this. What I'm doing may cause somebody else to fall. So whatever you do, tell them the truth. Whatever truth God has given to you, for you, tell them the truth. If your truth does not line up with their truth, but your truth is the truth that God gave you, 
you stand on the truth that God gave you. And if the truth that God gave you is not lining up with everybody else's truth, that's not your problem. You line your truth up with God. And whatever you do, do not cause someone else to falter. Three things I have for you today, my sisters and brothers. First is simply this. If you're one that has not received the salvation that can only be given through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I ask that you would consider at this time becoming, receiving salvation. All you have to do to be saved is simply this. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus died and rose again for us, so we shall be saved. If you are one who desires the salvation that can only be given through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, just repeat those words. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus died and rose again for me. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Secondly, my sisters and brothers, if you are one who does not have a church home, a place where you can come and really focus on the right things, not to lose your focus, to stay focused, to be focused, and as Imani even sung in, in the song, move forward in your focus, that you would not let things keep you behind, but that you would be propelled forward. We would love for you to consider Island Temple, love for you to come and be a part of what God is doing here. We'd love to have you here by the grace of God, simply because we believe here that this is the place for you, where we can be a blessing to you, you can be a blessing to us, and we can all follow God together. If you desire any information, please see us. You can see us at any time. You could call us, you could text us, you can write us, whatever the case may be, we would love to receive you. And lastly, if you're one who knows you've lost your focus. I ask that wherever you are right now, if you don't mind, for those that know you lost your focus, in whatever way you choose to make your acknowledgement, nobody has to know it but you. It can just be an acknowledgement of your mind. But if you know that you have lost your focus or losing your focus or find yourself struggling with focus, let us pray and look to God together. Gracious and everlasting Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity you've given us to come before you one more time. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to understand the importance of maintaining and keeping our focus by knowing that you are in charge, by understanding that our worship is only about our acknowledgement of who you are and how you're able to fill us that we might go forward in the world. And when we go forward in the world, we maintain our focus. Because when we lose our focus, we will cause others to stumble. Let us not be a stumbling block, an obstacle, or an impediment for anyone else, Lord, but instead, let us be a lifter, let us be an encourager, let us be a builder, let us be a helper, let us be a sustainer, let us be an accurate representation of you, Lord, in all that we do. And we shall ever be so careful to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet communion of God's Holy Spirit rest rule in the Bible with all of us, now, henceforth, and forevermore. And all God's people said amen, amen, amen.